Good morning, sunshines. Uh, welcome to the dark ages. <laughs> uh, uh, for those of you who have every man assigned to you as your play to uh, analyze, uh, make sure you send me your analysis uh, and then I will disseminate it to the rest of the class. Uh, again, you should be reading along as the rest of the class because the test will have essay questions on each of the plays. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me and let me know what questions are. And if it's something that I feel the rest of the class should share in the discussion, I'll uh, pass that along as well. Uh, Every Man uh, seems to me is a pretty straightforward play. Uh, there's not a whole, there's no subplots. There's uh, the action of the play is confined to the play itself. Pretty straightforward. Um, this is the first play that we've had that was written in uh, English. Of course, it's old English, uh, and so just as with Shakespeare for the next class period, you're going to find that there may be some instances where the language is a bit, a little bit archaic. Um, one of the things about every man is that it was probably handed down orally. In other words, tradition held that a, an actor would teach the next set of actors the, the role, but it was handed down from one actor to the other orally. It wasn't written down because, again, most of these actors during this time period were illiterate. Um, again, one of the things about, one of the major ironies uh, in the Dark Ages was that theater was pretty much squelched or ended uh, because it had been used as a, a, a tool against, a propaganda tool against uh, Christianity. And so once Christianity became the major religion in Rome, uh, Christians did just about everything they could to get rid of any evidence of the plays that had been performed during the second century BC AD, as we talked about last time. Uh, and so as the Roman Empire began to fall apart, uh, you have different uh, areas picking up uh, losing contact with the rest of the, the Western Hemisphere, again, the Eastern half of the Roman Empire, uh, becomes the Byzantine Empire and is still around for another thousand years or so. Uh, but in the West, we get, as I said last time, what uh, uh, Plato would ask for in a utopian society, there is no theater. Uh, so uh, theater, learning, uh, uh, language, uh, trade, every, pretty much everything comes to a stop in the Western half of the Roman Empire, or what happened in the Roman Empire, we're falling from the Dark Ages. Um, now let's talk about every man specifically before we get into what how we get back into the theater. Um, first of all, uh, whereas Oedipus Rex, uh, hopefully you understand that Oedipus Rex is a tragedy. Uh, hopefully you understood uh, that Lysistrata was a comedy. Uh, I'm going to say that every man is the first example that we've read of what I'm going to call a melodrama. It is a temporarily serious situation. Yes. Now, I know that every man has been told that he's going to die, which doesn't sound temporarily serious, it sounds pretty permanent to me. But in the context of the play, every man isn't drug, drug, yelling and screaming into the afterlife. He willingly goes to his death at the end of the play. Uh, now, along the route, he asks several of his friends and acquaintances to go along with him. And there are some people who travel with him. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a cousins, for instance. When he runs into cousins, he says, hey, dude, uh, can you want to come along with me? He's like, yeah, dude, let's go. Uh, and then suddenly he says, where are you headed? He says, well, I'm headed to die. And suddenly cousin's toe cramps up. Uh, so there are some, I'm not going to say hysterical, but there are some humorous points in the play. Uh, there are some very serious points in the play. Uh, again, uh, one of the things that happens in the course of the play is that at one point, uh, every man goes off to receive the seven sacraments uh, from the priest. Um, now, one of the things about the play is that the, the playwright is anonymous. Uh, again, I'm going to say that's due to the fact that it had been a story that had been handed down through the ages, and who exactly wrote the play was lost to history. Um, it was probably a part of what were called passion play, or the cycle plays, we'll talk about those in a second. Um, but it was probably presented by a guild, a group of workers, as a part of their celebration to the Christian church during the Easter time period. Uh, it was probably, uh, again, presented in a mansion. We'll, we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, but it was done probably uh, for a couple hundred years before it actually was written down in some form. Uh, again, the, there are examples of it that are written in Dutch. Uh, there is even one scholar who found a version that's similar to this in Chinese, and he's got this whole philosophy about how the Chinese suddenly sent their play through thousands of miles and made it, you know, in the course of a couple hundred years to to uh, England, 
because there's no trade route established in that time period, I'm going to say that may be a little bit of malarkey. But hey, who knows? It may be true in the, the, another 10 years from now, we may find some sort of uh, barrel that's buried that has the original text, and we'll figure it out that somebody came along the trade route and just didn't establish a continuous trade route. Anyway, uh, so uh, every man uh, is what's called an allegory. Now, an allegory is a, is a piece of work or an art that has a deeper or hidden or underlying meaning. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, every man is a very simple allegory. Uh, every man represents every man. <laughs> uh, cousins are the people who you're related to. Five wits are your senses. Uh, good deeds are your good deeds. Um, there, the, care, the beauty is your beauty. Knowledge is your knowledge. Um, the, care, the names of the characters are exactly who they are in the course of the play. And one of the things about the play that also is true, there are at least three characters in the play who are referred to in the female gender. They're called she or sister, that sort of thing. And so it hints that some of these characters may have been portrayed by females. Now, I'm gonna stand here and tell you that even though it may have been a female, just like in Roman and Greek times, a female was still played by a male actor, and the reason for that is because in Shakespeare's time, I absolutely am positive that all the roles were played by men. Uh, and it seems an odd choice for men to sudden, to, for women to be on stage and then suddenly not be on stage during Shakespeare's time without somebody coming forward and filing a lawsuit or proclaiming, you know, we're all gonna burn in hell. At least some sort of act that caused women to get kicked off the stage. And there's no evidence of that. So I'm gonna say again, uh, until some other evidence comes forward, that it's still all men performing these plays, again, uh, under the auspices of the church. And what I mean by that is that the money that they may have raised in the performance went back to the church. They're not try it's not a professional theater in the sense that they're not raising money for themselves. They're doing the play, they may collect some funds for doing the play, but any funds they collect or make go back into the church uh, to help the church uh, expand and that sort of stuff. Um, again, the, uh, the play itself, um, uh, people who wrote it obviously knew what Catholicism was. Um, they make fun of the priest at one point. It's, it's like, I hope he doesn't screw it up like he did last time, uh, which may be why they're anonymous. Uh, the, the people who could, <laughs> who could read and write during this time period were monks, mostly. Uh, again, uh, it may have been written by somebody who was uh, uh, one of some was subversive monk. <laughs> Uh, there certainly are a bunch of those out there. Um, but one of the things, again, just uh, uh, for those of you who are not Catholic, and I'm among them, uh, if you're a Baptist, maybe we got it easy. Uh, Baptists have the easiest religion known to man. Again, there are two things you shouldn't discuss with friends, religion and politics. But uh, even though I would love for to befriend you at some point, you're not my friends, you're my students. So we got to talk about a little bit about uh, religion today. Uh, for those of you who are not Baptist, welcome to the wonderful world of being a Baptist. Uh, being a Baptist, we got to do one thing. Baptist, what do we got to do? What do you got to do to get to heaven? Baptized. All you got to do, well, it helps to be baptized. Uh, but all you have to do is proclaim that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You don't have to get baptized. Uh, but you, you should get baptized. And like baptism is a representation that you are accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, you should try and save as many souls, convert as many souls as you can, but it's not like Peter is standing there with a roll card saying, how many, what was your scorecard? Well, I got three conversions before, oh, you get to go to heaven. Now, Catholicism, for instance, on the other end of the scale, uh, no matter how good you are, I mean, saints, yes, you still have committed some sin on this earth, and so in the, in the Catholic religion, you still have to go to some level of what they call purgatory. Now, again, I'm not Catholic, uh, it's not in the Bible, but I, I believe there are nine levels of hell. I could be wrong, there could be more <laughs> or less. Uh, but my understanding is, depending on how good or bad you are as a Catholic, you descend after your life into this level of purgatory and after your life, you work your way up through good deeds to the level where you eventually are allowed back into heaven. Again, it sounds much more rigorous and much more difficult after your life than being a Baptist. Uh, Methodists, uh, our good friend John Wesley went through the Bible and figured out every day what you should do in your life that day or that year to figure out how to get to heaven at the end of the day. 
and by God, you've got your little Methodist uh, book and <laughs> you follow it and that's all based on what John Wesley said you had to do. Uh, so different religions have different uh, approaches to achieving this uh, state of nirvana at the end of your uh, life. Uh, again, I'm going to say if you have a choice, uh, be a Baptist. <laughs> uh, but for the uh, for those of us who are uninitiated, and I'm going to get this wrong, uh, the seven sacraments, as I understand them, are baptism, uh, communion. Uh, there's the last rites. There's confession. There's uh, who I got four of them. One of the other three. Matrimony. Matrimony. And two more. Uh, <laughs> Priesthood. Priesthood. Uh, oh, what, what were you uh, uh, turn uh, 16 or whatever? Uh, confirmation. Confirmation. There you go. Uh, so those are the seven sacraments. Again, uh, not uh, unfamiliar to Baptists, but it's certainly not something you have to go through at any particular point in your life uh, as a Baptist. But again, different religions have different priorities about how those things are accomplished. Um, here's just a, a quick little video. Uh, about every man itself. There's a, a movie that's made out of it. That's, the movie's not too good, but at least you'll get a sense uh, of the play and the path that every man has to follow uh, based on the film here. Go thou to every man and show him in my name a pilgrimage he must on him take, which he in no wise may escape. Every man, good morrow by this day. Who calleth me? Every man? Every man! Stand still. I am sent to thee from God out of his majesty. What, sent to me? I am death, for it is God's commandment that all to me should be obedient. On thee thou must take a long journey. For no man is living today will I go that loathsome journey, not for the father that begat me. I will follow no man in such voyages. I would full fain, but I cannot stand verily. Your mind to folly would sooner apply than to bear me company in my long journey. Every man, I will go with thee and be thy guide, in thy most need to go by thy side. I will comfort you as well as I can. And a precious jewel I will give thee called penance, voider of adversity. My friends, come hither and be present. Discretion, strength, my five wits, and beauty. For thou mayst say, this is the day that no man living may escape away. What would ye that we shall do? That ye would, with every man go, and help him in his pilgrimage. Ask God mercy, and he will grant truly. Knowledge, give me the scourge of penance. But in any wise, be sure of mercy, for your time draweth fast. Will you forsake me? To whom now shall I trust? Again, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, not a lot of uh, deviation from the script at hand, uh, and pretty much everything you need to know is in the script. Uh, it is interesting to me that the last person to speak in the play is the doctor. Uh, again, that points to the fact that this is a secular play. It is written by somebody who's not in the church. Usually, if you have a play being performed in a church, uh, for those of you who go to an Easter service and have a play being performed at Easter, you know the priest or pastor is going to come up at the end of that uh, performance and give their little sermon uh, to add to their to the night's nice effect. Uh, in this play, you have a doctor come along. Uh, he is signifying that the body itself is dead, but that the soul is entered to the afterlife. Uh, but again, that points to the fact that this is a play that is written by people outside of the church, but certainly people who have a knowledge of the workings of the church, let's say. All right, let's talk about the Middle Ages. Again, the, the Dark Ages I'm going to consider from around 579, the fall of Rome, uh, until around 800, for a couple hundred years, you are in, truly in the Dark Ages where 
learning ceases, travel ceases, people, uh, the plague is not yet here, uh, but it's not far away. Uh, but society has ground to a halt. Uh, the first person to start reuniting the West, again, the East is still together as a, Byz in, as a Byzantine Empire for the next thousand years. But in the West, the first person to step forward and start reuniting nations within the West is Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne is the king of France. Uh, he was born in 748, lived until 814 AD. Um, one of the things about Charlemagne is that as he raised his army of about 10,000 soldiers, he would travel around France uh, and he would conquer these territories. They pretty much all sound like uh, bottles of champagne. As a matter of fact, champagne was one of the counties or countries he defeated. You have Burgundy, you, you just have a whole lot of counties that sound like wine bottles. And everywhere he went, he noticed that the, the community had spent a lot of money and time and energy building these enormous Gothic churches. And so he wasn't, a, he wasn't dumb. He figured out, hey, you know, who's the person who's got the money around here is the church. So again, a, the end of the 8th century, beginning of the 9th century AD, uh, he writes to Leo III, sends him a little text message who was the Pope at this time, and says, Leo, I'm on my way with my army. We're going to uh, take over the Catholic Church unless you come up with some other way of handling this. Uh, see you in a month. Uh, which is not necessarily something Leo wanted to hear, but suddenly he has this soldier in his army coming to take advantage of him in this position, a weak position that it is, being defended by the Swiss army. Uh, and so he knows that he's got to figure out something to give Charlemagne that will appease him. Uh, but that's not his only problem. Uh, one of the other problems that Leo has is there's this group uh, living in the north who are expanding their empire as well. Uh, they like to uh, sail the seas. Uh, they are very clever. Uh, they love the winter. Uh, they like wearing dresses in the winter. Well, I call them dresses, but skirts. Uh, they invade, I would say, northern uh, England uh, and start having sex with a bunch of Irish people and create this new race called Scottish people uh, who also like wearing skirts in the winter. Uh, they find this new luscious green land and they call it Iceland so that no one will go there. They find this rock that is frozen to death and they call it Greenland so that everybody will go there. Uh, they find this new Foundland uh, as they continue west. As a matter of fact, uh, if you haven't figured out by now, we're talking about the Vikings. Uh, the, there's a football team called the Minnesota Vikings, and one of the reasons that team exists and is called the Vikings is because there is evidence there are Viking camps along the Lake Superior in Minnesota. So the Vikings made it, could have made it as far west as uh, Minnesota in their travels. And so he, uh, Louis, Leo III, has Charlemagne on the way, but also on the horizon he can see the Vikings are coming. And so one of the things that he does uh, to help appease both people is he recreates the calendar. That's the perfect thing I would think of, right? I've got these people warring on the way, I've got to fix the calendar. Uh, Leo III is the first pope to establish a calendar based on Christ's birth as the dividing line. Before that, calendars existed, but they were always talked about the year of the reign of the monarch. Uh, and so one of the things that he and his monks do is they go back in history, add up all the years that, you know, these different popes and different uh, uh, the emperors of Rome had reigned and figured out exactly how long ago Christ had been born. And they established a calendar based on Christ's birth being zero, as we talked about before. They may have gotten it wrong by about three or four years. But as an example, we live in 2020. Something really important in your lives happened in 1214. That's a little over 800 years ago, which is the same distance that we are from that event that Leo was to Christ's birth. You know what it was? The signing of the Magna Carta. King John was forced to sign the Magna Carta, which gave citizens the right to trial by jury. In other words, King just said, couldn't say you're, dead, you're guilty and chop their heads off just because he wanted to. You had to actually have a, a trial by your peers. And there were other restraints put on the monarch that were established, the first time it was established was in the signing of the Magna Carta, which is around 805 years ago, which is about the same distance that Leo was from Christ's birth when he established the, the calendar based on Christ's birth. 
I'm gonna say for people who don't have a computer, that's pretty darn good. They got within uh, 10%, uh, they got within 2% of the date, yes? And so they established this calendar. Now again, we're gonna include January, February because uh, Jews Caesar had. Uh, we're very used to calling October the 10th month of the year, even though it has the wrong <laughs> prefix, all those sort of things. Um, uh, all right, just in case you've never wondered this, Sunday is easy. Now, first of all, it's not S-O-N, the Son of God Day. It's S-U-N, the Sun and Sky Day. Monday, I'll give you Moon Day, pretty easy. Uh, Saturday, Saturn is the equivalent of Zeus. Uh, and in Roman theology, Saturn is the god of Jupiter, is the father of Jupiter, and Jupiter is Zeus. So Zeus's dad, basically, is Saturday. I'll give you that one. Uh, Tuesday. What's a twos? Witness. <laughs> what in the world is a witness? Now, Thor, you might be able to get. Thor's day, if you've seen the Avengers, you know who Thor is. Who's Thor? God of Thunder. God of, God of the, who's God of Thunder? Oh, Norse. The Norse God of Thunder. So, uh, Freya, the Norse God of Love. Tews is the Norse God of War. Woden is the king of the Norse gods. Why are we naming days of the week after Norse gods? Because we're trying to befriend the Vikings and say, hey, you don't need to attack us. We are your friends. We have named days of the week after your gods. Um, one of the things about Christmas, we've avoided this conversation, but let's talk about Christ's birth. What day was Jesus born on? December 25th. December 25th, excellent answer. At least that's the day we celebrate. Uh, now, the problem with that is, of course, as we know from the Bible, the reason that Christ is in Bethlehem is because there is a uh, census being taken. By the way, fill out the census. Wherever you were April 1st, fill it out. It takes five minutes online. Uh, <laughs> there was a census being taken, and at this time period, the Romans decreed that you had to go back to the city of your birth, and so they went to Bethlehem because that's where Joseph had been born. Yes, and so they go there, but of course the inn is full, but they have a manger out back that they're renting, and of course Mary, while they're there, birth Jesus. Uh, you have the three wise men that are coming to see him because there's a star in the sky, blah, 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 blah. Now, do you make people travel in the middle of December for a census? Probably not. Probably it's more like April that you're making people travel, yes? And so most scholars agree that Christ probably was born any day other than December 25th. But so why was December 25th chosen? I'll give you the answer. In the Jewish tradition, you are circumcised. It's called a bris. You are circumcised as a male Jew. You're circumcised and given your name on the eighth day of your life. So if you're born on December 25th, follow along. Then 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, the eighth day of your life is January 1st. In other words, it's the first day of the new year. Cool? That's Jewish tradition. In Norse tradition, December 21st is the first day of winter. And whereas in Greece, the most important day is the first day of spring. In Norse tradition, the winter solstice is the biggest day because they love living in the north. And so they would go out and they would find the biggest, tallest, roundest tree they could find. They would chop it down. It was called the Yule log. They would set fire to it and it would typically burn for 12 days at the end of which they began their new year. So follow my math. Uh, and again, uh, just before we get there, uh, my guess is you may have tried, your preachers, priests, pastors may have tried to give sermons on the 12 days of Christmas. A lot of people in English, or well, in uh, Christianity, have tried to come up with the explanation for what the 12 days of Christmas are. You got Boxing Day, you got New Year's Eve, you got maybe five or six little holidays right there. They ain't 12 of them, okay? The 12 days are, of Christmas come from the Norse tradition, the pagan tradition, of cutting down a Christmas tree on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, January 1st, 12 days. January 1st becomes the first day of the new year. Hey, look, our calendars are in sync. 
your first day of the New Year is January 1st. Our first day of the New Year is January 1st. We have all these gods, your gods, who we named dates out of, after. So he's solving two problems with once, at once using a calendar. And when our good friend Charlemagne arrives in Rome, for those of you who are into numerology, if you're not, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, but trust me, 800 in numerology is the perfect number. It's an eight this way, it's an eight that way. Infinity, infinity. Uh, 800 is the perfect number, which again gives him a reason if it's 800-ish years before that Christ has been born, we're just going to make it 800, and we're going to say December 25th because it makes our calendar line up with the Viking calendar. And so on December 25th, 800 AD, Leo III crowns Charlemagne as the first emperor of what he calls the Holy Roman Empire. Now, ironically, the Holy Roman Empire is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Uh, but it's given that name by Pope Leo III. Uh, Charlemagne is given the crown and he's very happy with it. He lives for 14 years for that crown. Um, Charlemagne has a son named Pippin, uh, who uh, is a ne'er-do-well, let's call him, uh, and uh, sort of falls, uh, fails to live up to his father's expectations. So very quickly, the power that is represented by the Holy Roman Empire, even though the Pope never is put in charge of the Holy Roman Empire, the Pope is the person who always chooses the next emperor. And usually the Pope... Let's see, if you're going to choose somebody to be your Holy Roman Emperor, first of all, it's probably somebody who you're going to like. And second of all, it might be somebody who's given you a lot of goodies. So you have a lot of people trying to vie for your favor. And so it's good to be Pope during the reign of the Holy Roman Empire uh, once that has been established by Leo III. And for the next 600 or so years, the Holy Roman Empire grows and shrinks by adding counties and depending upon how strong it is during for certain time periods. But it is the first attempt to reunite the West, what has been the Western half of the Roman Empire. Now, the problem with doing all of that is that you have to tell people. They didn't have uh, uh, television. Uh, you don't have radio. You don't have movies. You don't have any other way to decree to the people, to the masses, that Charlemagne is the head of this thing you created called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, but you do have the church. And so suddenly the use of the pulpit becomes uh, a way of spreading not only the gospel, but spreading news of the day. Who's, who are your taxes going to? Who are, who's in charge? Uh, there are a lot of just daily information that until this time period didn't matter but now that we're uniting as a society, you need to have access to that information. And so that's the, the church becomes the way that the Holy Roman Empire is the glue that holds the Holy Roman Empire together. Yes. Um, and one of the things that they learn to do in order to help spread those, that news is to create this little thing called liturgical dramas. Uh, liturgical dramas are plays performed by the priests in the, the church, in addition to the mass, initially they were very, very short little plays. Um, there's a, a, a little phrase, uh, it's um, Latin. It's called quem queritas. I have to look it up because I, I say it wrong. Uh, but quem queritas means uh, uh, whom do you seek? Uh, it is uh, what the angel asked of Mary and the three Marys when they came to uh, wash Jesus' body the day after he was uh, crucified. Uh, so uh, the, initially the plays were all, whom do you seek? And the, that question would lead to uh, discussions of po politics of the day, let's just say. And over time, that little segment of the mass became a separate thing and eventually evolved into full-blown productions of various stories from the Bible. The liturgy. Uh, liturgy literally means teachings. So the liturgical dramas that develop, and again, I'm going to say their heyday begins around 1000 AD and they end around 1500 AD. Here's a little video telling you a little bit more about the liturgical dramas. So then, what did people do for fun in the Middle Ages? Well, they went to church.
because Christian ritual, especially as it became fancier and more formalized, ticked a lot of the boxes we associate with theater. Costumes, props, songs, and movement up and down the aisles that maybe looks a bit like dance if you squint really hard. While no one is exactly sure how we get from the medieval mass to the large-scale cycle plays and passion plays, which we'll talk about in a bit, most scholars believe that the resurgence of drama began as part of the Easter service sometime in the 10th century CE. This began with an exchange known as the quem queritus, which is Latin for whom do you seek? Or in a slightly more casual translation, hey, who you Christian ladies looking for over in that there sepulcher? Where does the quem queritus come from? And why does it get going at all? Unclear. It seems to be a mashup of sections from the Gospel of Luke and then a couple of apocryphal gospels, the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Mary. It appears in the Regularis Concordia, a sort of rule book for Benedictine monasteries compiled by Ethelwald, Bishop of Winchester in around 970 CE. We can guess that it was adopted to heighten excitement and suspense at a key moment of the Easter service, just before the discovery of the resurrection. In the Quem Quiritus, the three Marys speak to some angels. These are the Virgin Mary, the Magdalene Mary, and Mary, the sister of Lazarus, the Mary that everyone forgets about. The parts were probably first undertaken by two sections of a choir using antiphonal singing, and then later by individual monks or clerics. It goes like so. Angels. Whom do you seek in the sepulchre, O followers of Christ? Marys. Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified, O heavenly ones. Angels. He is not here. He is risen, just as he predicted. Go announce that he is risen from the sepulchre. And that gripping dialogue is what probably restores theater to the West. Here's old Ethelwald describing a typical staging in the Thought Bubble. While the third lesson is being read aloud, four of the brothers should dress themselves. One of them, wearing an alb, should come in as though intent on other business and go stealthily to the place of the sepulchre. Then, while the third response is being sung, the three remaining brothers, all of them wearing copes and carrying thuribles with incense in their hands, should walk slowly and haltingly, making their way to the place of the sepulchre as if they are seeking something. For these things are done in imitation of the angel seated on the tomb and of the women coming with perfumes to anoint the body of Jesus. When, therefore, the one sitting there sees the three drawing near, he should begin to sing sweetly in a moderate voice, Whom do you seek? The three should answer together in one voice, Jesus of Nazareth. He to them, he is not here, he has risen as he predicted. Go tell the news that he has risen from the dead. And then, having said these things, he should stand up and raise the veil, showing them the empty place where the cross had been laid, where there should be nothing but the linen bands in which the cross had been wrapped. Seeing this, they should put down the thuribles, which they have carried into the sepulchre, and taking up the linen cloths, they should hold them out toward the assembled clergy, as though showing them that the Lord has risen and is now no longer wrapped in them. And they should sing this antiphon. The Lord has risen from the tomb. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So there you have it, the first liturgical drama, so-called because it emerges out of the Christian liturgy, or service. And now, maybe you're thinking, wow, that is just super exciting, definitely much preferable to naval battles and nude mimes. But hang on a second, this exchange may not sound thrilling now, but then it was. Before this, you just have a priest reciting passages from the Bible. But this moment where other members of the clergy step out and answer, this is a really big deal. Remember the origins of ancient Greek theater when Thespis got the bright idea to step out from the dithyrambic chorus and actually imitate some of the action instead of just singing about it? Well, this is like that, even down to the religious context. So really, it's not so different from the Dionysian celebrations, though this is a comparison that most church fathers of the Middle Ages would not have appreciated. I may wager there wasn't much that they would appreciate to be quite H, though. What's most important about the Quem Quiritus is that even if it sounds heckin' dull, it really catches on. Parishioners enjoyed a break from the usual church service, and the trend spread, both throughout the liturgical year and 
throughout Europe. At first, these brief dramas were always in Latin and always in prose, but later were written in vernacular language and sometimes in verse. Gradually, different areas of the church were used, and the clerics made increasing use of costumes and props. But in the 12th and 13th centuries, liturgical drama had moved away from the life of Jesus and was being used to tell favorite Old Testament stories and recount the lives of saints, often with troubling streaks of anti-Semitism, though. As we'll see in a few episodes, in due time, these small liturgical dramas flower into much longer, larger spectacles, increasingly staged, get this, outside the church. It again, uh, these became very popular, still in Latin, though. Uh, and again, a lot of people uh, were, uh, were illiterate in Latin. Uh, obviously, the monks, uh, one of the things about Martin Luther, we'll talk about Martin Luther in a little bit, Martin Luther can't read or write in uh, Latin, and he's a monk. Uh, so one of the things that happens when the Bible is suddenly printed in German, he's able to go through the Bible in the, in the language that he does speak and figure out a bunch of things the Pope says that aren't true. But we'll get to that in a second, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, eventually these plays become popular enough that around 1200 AD, uh, they are taken outside the church. Uh, the Pope rules that uh, priests cannot perform in plays outside of the church. Uh, and so these things that I'm going to call passion plays, they've got a lot of names. Uh, one of the things, people sometimes call them miracle plays, uh, not because they are miraculous, but because the people that perform these plays are carpenters, or masons, or bakers. They're the people who have these uh, miracle things that each of them knows these secrets about how to make bread rise about how to make uh, uh, stone stick together, about how to make cement, uh, mortar, uh, about how to use, build nails and keep uh, you know, snow from crushing in your roof. Everybody in their guilds has little secrets about how to keep the sole of the shoe attached to the sides of the shoe. Uh, apparently people still can't figure that out because I, I can't keep my soles of my shoes on my shoes. But uh, there apparently are people that know how to do these sort of things, I just gotta find them. Uh, but these people know these little miracles and because, just like in every man, those are the people that are performing the plays, sometimes they're called miracle plays. Um, the passion plays, the reason I call them passion plays, and I'm gonna stick with that one, is because these were performed during the week of Easter. Easter is called the Passion Week. So from, uh, uh, from Palm Sunday, through Monday, Thursday, through Good Friday, uh, through the, his resurrection on the Sunday of Easter, that's the week of Easter. And again, it, uh, one of the things about Easter as a holiday, we'll spend two seconds on this and we'll finish about Passion Place. Um, uh, the Bible does say that Easter was, uh, that, that Easter occurred, that, that Christ rose from, from the dead, on the first Sunday, after the first full moon, after the first day of spring. So follow me. Uh, it doesn't say a particular day, but the first day of spring is March 20th, 21st, depending on the, where you are in the cycle. Um, if March 21st happens to have a full moon, and if Sunday the 22nd of March is a Sunday, Easter could be as early as March 22nd. Now, if March 21st, the first day of spring, there are 28 days between full moons. So if the next full moon isn't until, let's see, that's 10, 8, the April 18th, and then that's on a Monday, then it's not till the Sunday, April 24th, that could be Easter. So Easter can be anywhere from March 22nd to April 24th, depending upon when the first full moon after the first day of spring uh, on the first Sunday after that first full moon is. That's why Easter moves around all the time. Uh, but that week is the Passion Week, and that week was when these the, these uh, churches would take their plays outside of the church. They would set up a series of uh, what are called mansions. There's a little picture of uh, down the bottom page there of the various mansions. We'll go over it in a second. Uh, they would build these. Uh, there were four mansions. Um, I'm going to go from left to right. The uh, when I first started teaching this class 30 years ago, before any of you were born, uh, I had been taught when I was in school. But that mansion to the left of the round circular thing was just a painted thing. 
Now, in the last 20 years, there have been discoveries, people have found archaeological digs, where they've recovered the actual mechanism that was that thing, and in reality, it probably was a real person sitting on a real chair, a real throne, with real people strapped in, circling around him, blowing real horns. I'm going to say that was pretty impressive. Now, I'm going to call that heaven. Uh, and again, there are four stages. They call them mansions, four mansions, four stages four raised areas. Now, between heaven and the next mansion, which I'm gonna call, let's see, what do we call it? The, the Radisson, the Marriott. A very nice high-end uh, little palace. You can see there's a little fenced-in area there. Uh, I'm gonna say that there's a lot of uh, small animals in uh, the Bible. Uh, little sheep, little goats, uh, little lambs, yes. Uh, so I'm gonna say that because there's a little fenced-in area there, I'm gonna say that's a little pet zoo. You go in, you let the ducks bite the children and they scream and all that sort of stuff. You feed the ducks for a dollar or whatever. Uh, I'm going to say that's a little pinned in area. We've got little pigs, little donkeys, all that sort of mess. That can be used in the production of the plays as well. But for the most part, it's just a fun little place for people to go while they're wandering around this festival. Uh, then you have a, a mansion that I said is the Radisson, the, the Marriott. A very high-end, palace looking thing. You have another door and then you have a smaller mansion, which I'm going to say, well, it's called the Red Roof Inn. Uh, La Quinta, yes, a little less impressive mansion. Um, then there's this little square area there uh, that uh, looks like to me a little pond, but because it's square, I'm gonna say it's a man-made pond. Uh, you could, someone has cut that out and filled it with water. Uh, and on the pond, if you can see it there, it's mostly in silhouette, but there's a boat there. There's a three-masted ship that's on this pond. I'm going to say things like Jesus walking on the water, uh, Joan and the whale, any kind of any kind of uh, 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 liturgical play, uh, biblical play that you have that it happens to happen on water, that's where you do it. And then I'm going to say the person who did this uh, painting in, this, in their diary, uh, it's called the Passion Play at Valenciennes, and the, the drawing was done in the 16th century. Uh, I'm going to say that thing on the right is the thing that most caught their 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 imagination. Uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, dragons. Uh, you live in the age of superstition. Without knowledge, without scientific knowledge, without knowing what things are, you come up with these great imagination, imaginary ideas. So for instance, one of the things that people would find skulls of mammoths. Now, you and I both know that an elephant, a mammoth, has a big trunk, and they have a breathing hole in their skull for where the trunk descends. Well, when you find the skull, the ocular cavities are way to the right and to the left, if you remember what an elephant looks like or a mammoth looks like. But because we as humans are accustomed to having the ocular, the eyes, in the front of the face, it was mistaken that this skull of this mammoth was a skull of what they call cyclopses, that have one huge eyeball in the middle of their head. And that's how the, the, the idea of a cyclops is born from the skeletons of those things lying around. Again, there are pterodactyls, there are all these uh, skulls of all these dinosaurs that all have sharp teeth, some of them have wings. You put them all together, you create dragons. And of course, if you're gonna create a dragon, it's gotta be a fire breathing dragon, come on. Uh, anyway, so the mythology around these creatures, because you don't have the scientific method to explore what they are, they obviously are these hellacious things that have come to eat and devour you for those of you who have committed sins. This part of the stage was called the hell mouth. And not only was it, again, not the first year. Again, I'm going to say this, just like the theater in Dionysus grew from a couple hundred people to a couple 10, 15,000 people. Over time, this is in the 16th century, I'm going to say when it first started in 1,000, you may have had one mansion, right? You may have had one stage that was performed on. But over time, you had enough mansions that you had continuous action, or simultaneous action is what it's called. It was much like a fair. You could walk from one stage to the next stage. You could see a whole performance of one thing. Uh, there were about 40 plays being presented. There were uh, several hundred local citizens who were involved in this. And you would have the town next door come to your passion plays. Uh, uh, there are still passion plays to that today that every 10 years or so, they, the whole town will shut down, especially in Germany, uh, where the whole town will put on a passion play. Uh, so this still exists today. Now, one of the nice things about the Hellmouth is that every Halloween, you would just pull that out of storage and present that again as part of your Halloween celebration. Now again, 
Um, oh, what's the uh, what's the name of the, the Disney film that's uh, based about the death of uh, Cuomo? Not Cuomo. That's the mayor of New York. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, there one of the things in, in the Catholic tradition is that you have All Hallows Day is November first, uh, and All Hallows Eve is December thirty first. And what you would do on All Hallows Day is invite your dead relatives into your home to advise and give you uh, information about what choices to make, who should get married, what you should do with your life in order to, to prosper in the future. Well, on All Hallows Eve, you wanted to scare away the, the drunk uncles and all the bad people. And so you would put on costumes and bang drums and do all this crazy stuff in order to scare away the bad relatives. So when you invite the good relatives in on the, the 1st of November, that's who advised you correctly, yes. Uh, this is a tradition that is still performed in many Hispanic cultures. Uh, today we have distorted it to where we give candy and dress up as you know monsters and that sort of stuff on, on, on uh, uh, Halloween. Uh, but we really don't celebrate No Hallows Day at all in the West. Um, but th this gave this type of performance yet another time to raise money for the church. Again, all these performances were pr performed by uh, secular individuals, not priests. But all the money that they raised went back into funding of the church. Yes. Um, now, a couple of the names. You have the Passion Play, which is the week of Easter, which is again what I'm going to call it. The Mystery Plays, because they were performed by guild members. Uh, there are sometimes also called the Cycle Plays, because many of the plays were about the life and death of Jesus Christ. So anytime they had a play about Jesus, uh, Every Man is not a Cycle Play. It is a morality play, because it teaches a moral lesson. Yes, so those are the types of plays that are being performed during Passion Week. Um, again, miracle plays are about the saints. Uh, those are another type of play that were done during this time period. So again, a lot of different types of plays all performed during the Passion Week, which is where I give them the name. Um, but here's a little video talking a little bit about each of these type of plays. And by the 11th and 12th centuries, got pretty elaborate. It expanded out from the altar and spread all over the church, occupying small spaces usually known as mansions, which were decorated to suggest different scenes. One personal favorite of mine, the Hellmouth. For a while, liturgical drama works. You have the liturgy, you have the drama, you have the mansions. It's religious fun for the whole family. But eventually, it's just not enough. Because here's the thing. Medieval Gothic churches are big. They're really big. They're trying to stretch all the way up to heaven to capture something of God's majesty in glass and stone. If you've ever stood in Notre Dame or York Minster, you're like, yep, this is some world-class majesty. And yet, even these colossal churches become too small to contain the awesomeness that is theater. So, liturgical drama moves to the only other place with enough square footage to accommodate all that dang majesty outside. So now you're thinking, yay, fun, liturgical drama al fresco. Not so fast, though. In 1210, Pope Innocent III issues an edict saying that the clergy can't perform plays in public. And the clergy are like, oh well. But the people are like, no, 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 you can't walk it back. We want hell mouths. Bigger. Better. More. So in the early 13th century, a radical thing happens. Drama moves from being a clerical phenomenon to being a secular one. We back, baby. Since Roman times, for more than a thousand years, Christians have hated theater. But obviously Christians also loved theater, or the liturgical drama wouldn't have caught on the way that it did. Performing plays inside the church, basing them exclusively on the Christian liturgy and having members of the clergy act in them were the strategies Christians used to make it less sinful. But that's all gone now. Drama has left the building, and by building I mean basilica. Priests are no longer the actors. Bring on the incest plots and the nude rope dancers. Okay, it doesn't escalate that quickly. It's going to take theater a few decades to get truly decadent. Theater sticks pretty closely to the Bible and associated religious texts as the liturgical dramas transform into the cycle plays. The cycle plays are an ambitious genre of medieval drama that depicts the whole history of the Christian universe, starting with the creation of the world and ending with the death and resurrection of Christ and skimming most of the Old and New Testaments in between. Some of them go all the way up to the Last Judgment. In England, the performance of cycles began sometime in the late 1300s and continued until the late 1500s, when they were banned because of the English Reformation. Protestants weren't so keen on graven images, even fun 
theater ones, and cycle plays were also seen as just too Catholic. The same thing happened throughout Europe. In the age of religious disputes and wars, religious drama was seen as just too controversial, even if it was very popular. In some cities, cycle plays were organized by religious guilds, but in many places, especially England, they were produced by trade and craft guilds. This is why they're also sometimes known as mystery plays, because a mystery was another word for a trade. So carpentry, that's a mystery, as are shipbuilding, blacksmithing, and baking. The plays themselves aren't mysteries like Murder, She Wrote, or Serial. They're more about mystery in the religious sense. So who done it? God. Pretty much always. Sometimes Judas. Cycle plays are also known as passion plays if the particular cycle focuses on the passion of the Christ. In most cases, each guild would be responsible for staging a biblical story, usually one overlapping with their work. So the shipwrights might take on Noah and the Ark, the bakers, the Last Supper. Each guild would supply the costumes, actors, and set, and they would pile it all into a big cart known as a pageant wagon basically a theater mobile. The carts were trundled through town, stopping often at fixed points to perform, or maybe they stayed put and audiences moved to them, scholars aren't sure. And by the way, the move from cart to cart mirrors the way dramatic action would move from mansion to mansion in liturgical dramas. Each play lasted for half an hour, and there were upwards of 40 plays. If you thought Les Mis was long, ugh, get ready. The cycle dramas were often performed over several days, though, so you weren't expected to sit for 20 straight hours. You could relieve yourself, grab a beer or a lard-based pie. Most actors weren't professionals either. They were men and boys drawn from the working class. And in some towns, women participated. Amateur actors were expected to take their work very seriously, though. You got fined if you didn't know your lines. The cycle plays were a big draw for tourists and a chance for towns to show off their civic pride and their skills as craftspeople. Ooh, mysterious. Most plays restated the basic action of a Bible story, though guilds would dress stories up with anachronistic jokes and the occasional bit of troubling anti-Semitism. Plays were typically a mix of highly stylized action and contemporary realism, and authors were mostly anonymous, though a couple of Frenchmen signed their plays about the lives of the saints, also known as miracle plays. Medieval stagecraft wasn't the most sophisticated. I mean, when your stage is a wagon, there are limits. But guilds wanted to put on a good show, so there were plenty of special effects like trap doors, fake corpses, fake blood, and some fire effects. I know, right? Don't tell the fire marshal guild. One of the um, again, um, the community was greatly involved. Uh, some of these plays got written down, but most of them, for the most part, were lost to history. Obviously, you have a second shepherd's play as an example of one of these type of plays. There was probably a first shepherd's play, except that we don't have a copy of it. So again, sometimes the people were literate, and so writing down the story was helpful. Sometimes it was just the more impressive plays that were actually written down. Uh, but there was a great deal of information and history that was just passed down from generation to generation orally. Yes, Eventually, the plays became popular enough that the plays were actually performed outside of Easter week, on these things called pageant wagons. Uh, the pageant wagons would be these uh, cycle plays and or passion plays, morality plays, miracle plays, whichever one you want to call it. They were put onto wagons and taken into the community, done still in the common tongue, but they were done by actors who were hired by the church to go out and perform these things. So as opposed to the passion plays, which were done by guild members, by bakers, by uh, shepherds, uh, by carpenters, the pageant plays, excuse me, the pageant wagon plays were performed by actors who specifically were hired by the church. So you found a good actor in one of these plays and instead of letting them become a baker, you hired them to send them out to continue to raise money for the church the rest of the year. Yes, the nice thing is you could advertise these, these pageant wagon plays. They were really catching on um, around the 14th century, but again, all these things sort of end the 15th century with what is called the English Reformation. I'm gonna put a big stick right there, English Reformation. Because in order to get on from the English Reformation, we have to go back in time. There's something that's happening in the world while all this is happening that we haven't discussed. And this is the point where it gets important to know this. Uh, there's a man named Muhammad, yes? Uh, his uh, family is starving. He is a lower class. He lives in Mecca, which is in Arabia, today is Saudi Arabia. Um, around 610 or so, 
he is caught stealing bread. And the punishment for that crime is either one of two things. They can chop his hand off or they can exile you for a year. And he chooses to exile. And while he is in exile, apparently, according to the friend, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, comes to him in this cave and tells him about life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, what you need to do to be fulfilled as a human being. And he becomes a prophet, in other words. He goes back and tells his brother, uh, one of the things about Muhammad, you know, Muhammad is illiterate, he can't read or write. He goes back, he tells his brother the stories that he has been told and the discussions that he's had with Gabriel. Uh, his brother writes it down in a book called the Quran. Now, how many books of the Bible did Jesus write? None. Uh, everything in the Bible, there are people that quote Jesus, but everything that was written in the Bible about Jesus was written by somebody else talking about Jesus. How much of the Quran did Muhammad and his brother write? Every single word. Now, in the course of writing the Quran, they quote from the Bible. There are quotes from the Bible that are in the Quran. Uh, the Quran believes, uh, the Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet, just not the prophet. Muhammad becomes the prophet. Well, in 622, uh, Muhammad and his family are kicked out of Mecca because they are causing consternation. As all true prophets are, you get kicked out. Uh, so he runs away for the next eight or ten years. Uh, he starts preaching the message of, his, message of Islam, finds a whole bunch of followers. And in 629, he goes back and his, he and his family and his followers uh, take over the city of Mecca. And it is around that time again, 629, 630, when suddenly the spread of Islam begins. In 637, they made it to Jerusalem and they conquer the city of Jerusalem. They start conquering along North Africa. All this stuff, as they get north, closer and closer to Constantinople, more and more calls for help go out to the west from the east, and the Pope suddenly comes in and says, guys, we'll come to your help. They're called the Crusades. Here's a little bit of information about the Crusades. <laughs> The Crusades were military campaigns waged by Western European Christians during the Middle Ages for the defense and expansion of Christendom. What made a crusade distinct was that warriors involved in the fighting received spiritual merit, usually a plenary indulgence granted by the Pope. A crusade was considered by Western European Christians to be a holy act, an act of sacrifice and piety for the love of Christ. Four centuries before the beginning of the Crusades, the first Muslim army swept out of Arabia to conquer Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, North Africa, and Spain, some two-thirds of the Christian world. Between the 7th and 11th centuries, Christians fought wars against Muslims to prevent them from making further conquests into Christian territory, or to reconquer what had already been captured. In Spain, Christian kingdoms waged wars to recapture their homeland from the Arabs, while the Byzantine Empire in the east was engaged in centuries of war with the Muslims for control of Anatolia and other regions. In the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks, recent converts to Islam, swept through Syria and Palestine. In 1071, they defeated the Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert, conquering almost all of Anatolia. In response, Pope Urban II called the First Crusade, asking knights from all over Europe to band together and push back the Seljuks. Over the 12th and 13th centuries, the popes called more crusades to the Holy Land and also called for crusades in Spain to help push back the Muslim powers. Crusades against Muslims were not called with the intention of converting them to Christianity. Rather, they were called to regain control of territory that had been previously Christian, but had fallen to Muslim armies. Jerusalem had been conquered by the Muslims in 637, and was considered particularly important to Western Christians, since it was the site of Christ's crucifixion. Indeed, Jerusalem was revered as the holiest site in the Christian cosmos, and it was particularly important to Western Europeans that it be brought again under Christian rule. When, in the 11th century, news arrived that Christian pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem were being harassed and killed by the Seljuk Turks, this fact alone inspired many knights to join the First Crusade. 
Although the Crusades were called to reclaim lands, greed was not a primary motivation. Professor Jonathan Riley Smith, the world's foremost expert on Crusades history, has proven that crusading was incredibly dangerous and expensive, and that virtually none of the knights who went could expect to gain wealth. Indeed, they often bankrupted themselves crusading. The primary motivation for crusading was spiritual, with the knights joining because they believed that they were doing God's work by fighting to protect Christian pilgrims and to reclaim holy sites like Jerusalem, and that involving themselves in a crusade would win them spiritual merit. The Crusades to the Holy Land saw many failures but also many successes. The First Crusade and the Third Crusade, for example, were both very successful, though ultimately later, at the close of the 13th century, the last Crusader holdings in Syria and Palestine would be captured by the Muslim Mamluk Empire. However, the Crusades in Spain achieved lasting victory, with the whole of Spain being ultimately recaptured by the Christians. Later Crusades would also be called against the Ottoman Turks, such as the Crusade of Lepanto in 1571. So there are a total of nine Crusades. The first Crusade, again, uh, begins around the 11th century. Um, uh, and the last Crusade is in the 16th century. From, so from 1095 to 1571, there are nine Crusades. Basically, again, this is not a history class, but basically about once every 50 years, you have enough 15 to 20 year olds, or 25 year olds, to go out and fight a new Crusade. And again, as opposed to the battles that we talked about where the Greeks and the Romans would have a hero, these were full on wars. These were full-on battles. And so if you had traveled a thousand miles from England to Jerusalem to fight a crusade and you lost a thousand people, you had to wait for another thousand people to grow up to in order to go fight the battle. Uh, there were a couple of crusades, as they pointed out in the crusades, there were a couple of crusades that were successful in this, to the extent that they were able to recapture Jerusalem for some period of time, 20 or 30 years. The problem is the people that are fighting the crusades live in England, France, Germany, Eventually, those people are going to go home, and the people that are fighting live in Jerusalem. And so eventually, even the most successful crusades, the city of Jerusalem falls back into the hands of Muslims. Uh, and so the important thing about this, two things are important about this. One is the idea of forgiveness. The Pope says that any act you create or perform while in the crusade, because your crusade is a noble effort in the pursuit of Christians worldwide, of getting, of getting conquering the Muslims. Uh, any act you commit, no matter how heinous, is immediately forgiven. Yes? So, any raping, burning, pillaging that you may have to do, even if it's not necessarily for the war, even if it's just for fun, forgiven because you're on a crusade for Christ. Now, I've done a lot of raping, burning, and pillaging in my life. There's only so much of it you can do. Eventually, you've got to sit around a campfire and you've got to sing songs about the homeland. So the other important thing and aspect about this, I've never done very, very um, uh, The other important part about this is that suddenly you start making up tales of, let's say, Robin Hood, of Camelot, all these myths that you start creating about things back home, yes? So that's another aspect that's going to become important in the theater, yes? going back to our little stick that's in the, in the woods uh, with the uh, fall of, of uh, excuse me, the, the Elizabethan transformation, yes. Uh, you have uh, our good friend, uh, Henry VIII, yes. Henry VIII is actually the second son of Henry VII. The, Henry VIII's older brother, believe it or not, is a man named Arthur. And Arthur, when Arthur is 12 years old, Arthur is betrothed, in other words, promised to be married, uh, to uh, the Catherine of Aragon, the most powerful nation in the world at the end of the 15th century, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. The most powerful nation in the world during that time period was Spain. Now, Christopher Columbus was Italian, yes, which means he knew how to sail a ship, but his, his travels were funded by the Spanish court, yes? And so all the lands that he discovered in America were all owned by the Spanish. And so the English had made this arrangement where Arthur was betrothed to Catherine of Aragon, the, the oldest, the youngest, excuse me, the oldest daughter of the Spanish king and queen. Um, she was 14 years his senior. She was 26, he was 12. 
even though, and here's something fun about Catholic marriage. Uh, Catholics, uh, uh, when they get married, the wedding is supposed to have happened or the marriage is cons consummated at the time of the betrothal. Uh, the ceremony is merely a celebration of the wedding, but at this period of time, for instance, if you live in the hinterlands, you may not see a priest for a couple of months. And so what would happen is you would be betrothed to a person, you could start living together as man and wife, and then when the priest showed up, you could actually have a ceremony, a service, but you didn't have to wait for the priest to show up, uh, especially with the plague that was going on, on, which killed about half of Western Europeans. And I would say the plague was mostly caused by these idiots coming back and forth from the crusade. Uh, anyway, so uh, the crusade, sort of just like this pandemic we're in now, uh, had a great impact on society. Uh, anyway, the, uh, instead of losing the betrothal, Henry VII transferred the betrothal from Arthur, who was 12, to, uh, well, Arthur died in an accident, he fell off horse and killed himself. Well, he didn't kill himself, but he died. Uh, so his brother, Henry, is eight. So he's 16 years younger than uh, Catherine Baragon. Of course, they didn't actually consummate physically the marriage until he was 18, which means she was 34, yes? Uh, they started having dead baby after dead baby after dead baby. They had one living female child. And I'm going to say for the first three years of the marriage, they were happy as could be trying to have more male heirs. Finally, Henry VIII had had enough of all these dead babies. And so he was looking through the Bible and he was very, uh, he was very pious. He planned to be a priest before this happened and before his brother died. Uh, he goes to Leviticus. Now I'm going to tell you, in the Bible, if it's something bad, it's in Leviticus. Where does it tell you I'm supposed to stone women who don't have a head, uh, uh, women who are not married and don't have a headdress on? It says in Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus has just got a lot of rules. Among them is, if you lay with your brother's wife, all your children will be stillborn. Uh, and so he points to this verse and says, hey, I figured out why all my babies are dead, because even though they never slept together, they were betrothed to each other, therefore they were wedded, therefore I've married my wife's, uh, my brother's wife, that's why I'm having all these dead babies. And so he petitioned the Pope for a divorce. And the Pope says, that's great rational, I love it. Uh, the problem is you've had this one daughter and you haven't killed anybody, so obviously you and your wife have consummated the marriage physically, therefore I'm gonna deny your uh, appeal for a divorce. Going back the other way, one of the most important things in the 15th century, a matter of fact, Time Magazine says it's one of the most important things that ever happened in the second millennium, is the invention of the printing press. Uh, in 1440 AD, a man named Gutenberg in Germany uh, invents movable type. The press had been around, but he invents movable type, which makes it easy to print things like books. And one of the things he prints is this Bible, and the, he prints it in German. And so as I hinted at earlier, Martin Luther uh, found this Bible and went through the Bible. And among the things, for instance, there was this pre-forgiveness, uh, this thing called an indulgence that they would sell. An uh, indulgence was a pre-forgiveness for sin. So if I wanted to go to the beach this weekend and commit sinful acts and not tell anybody, I could pay a certain fee, do a certain number of Hail Marys. I bought an indulgence, therefore I don't have to tell anybody what we did or what I have sinned, yes. Uh, Martin Luther goes through the Bible, he says, I can't find any proof that the indulgence should be around, it's not in the Bible. I can't find anything about crusades being instantly forgiven. There, he found 96 things that the Pope says were true that he can find no evidence for in this Bible that he's able to read now because it's in German. And in Wittenberg, Germany in 1491, he takes uh, this thesis and nails it to the church doors and it begins this protest movement, this protestant movement. Yes, and Henry VIII looks toward Martin Luther and says, hey, you're having problems with these people in Germany. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna separate from the Catholic Church, start my own church called the Anglican Church. Uh, it's the Church of England. Uh, I'm gonna establish, everything is gonna be the same except that instead of the Pope being the head of the church, the king or the monarch of England is gonna be the head of the church. And in order to get a divorce in the Anglican Church, all I could do is ask the monarch, and so he asked the monarch, can I get divorced from Catherine? And the monarch says, sure. And so he gets divorced. Again, he eventually has six wives. Uh, he has another living daughter, Elizabeth. Um, 
uh, which responds to the Elizabethan theater of the Elizabethan age. Uh, Mary is the first daughter who was Mary, uh, Bloody Mary, we'll call her. Uh, she was Catholic. Uh, Elizabeth was Protestant, and there's a big fight that's going to happen about that. But suddenly, you imagine you're out there being on your little pageant wagon. Yes? Uh, the colors for the Catholic Church, if you had a little banner, the colors were, as your little horse rode around along, it was a bright yellow over light blue. That's the banner. The, the colors for the Anglican Church were light blue over yellow. All they did was flip the flag. So suddenly it's a windless day, these soldiers drive up, and depending upon who you say you're supporting, which church you're in favor of, you, as an actor, could get your head chopped off. Uh, Thomas More was Henry VIII's best friend in, in school growing up. Thomas More was also the Archbishop of Canterbury during this time period and uh, was told Henry VIII that he couldn't separate from the Catholic Church. Henry VIII cut off Thomas More's head. If Henry VIII is going to kill his best friend, who does he care about I'm some actor in the hinterlands? And so one of the things that suddenly happened almost overnight, you suddenly have these people who are out performing on these pageant wagons, who have a network of stops. They've already figured out over the years, I can go to this restaurant, I can go to this hotel, I can go to this inn, and these people will house me and feed me and I can do my play and they're used to seeing me and they love me as an actor. And instead of doing plays that are based on liturgical things, or every man, that type of play, we're gonna do a play based upon, oh, I don't know, Robin Hood, Maid Marian. These secular plays that can still make money for us instead of having to pay the church our money, we get to keep the money ourselves. It is called professional theater. So out of this chaos forms the world's first professional theater. They're called the Mummers. It's called Mummers Plays. And that's where we'll begin next time. See you then.